I'd like to just take this opportunity to ask you a few questions, um, just so the audience can get to know you a little bit before we go into your presentation. So can you share with us a little bit about your uh, research uh, and your background prior to getting into cannabis? Yeah, sure. So actually getting into the cannabis and pain space was uh, completely out of whack with what I was doing beforehand in the sense that I was a applied environmental microbiologist studying water quality. And uh, I just serendipitously, to a certain extent, happened to get into the, the cannabis space during my PhD. Um, and, you know, Beforehand, I had been looking at Helicobacter pylori, which causes stomach cancer, seeing if that could be transmitted in water, doing a lot of animal studies and uh, field studies. But then as I, as I was going on, I actually attended a talk um, also at the School of Public Health looking at cannabis for chronic pain, uh, look at, sorry, looking at cannabis, uh, the effects of smoke cannabis on the body. And there's very little in that talk about how people were using cannabis in a therapeutic setting, but a lot on you know, how it affects executive function in these negative ways. Um, so while I was doing all this you know, applied microbiology, I ended up doing a, a survey uh, to see how people with chronic pain use cannabis. And a lot of them reported uh, a dramatically decrease in their opioid use. So that ended up being an impetus for me to split off into the medical cannabis, cannabis and, and pain field. Interesting. That's really, really interesting. And um, so your uh, you know, bio shows that you're doing so, some really interesting stuff and, and you're going to hit it uh, in your presentation. So I guess we'll leave uh, that for the presentation. But I want to ask you another question that, that you and I had talked about a little bit prior. So it's interesting in the cannabis space, the uh, lexicon or the lack of a standard lexicon, right? So we had discussed a little bit about... Um, this use of the word uh, pot. So I'm curious if you can uh, share some of your thoughts about the, the different use of some of these words, pot, cannabis, marijuana. What, what, do, you, what do you think about the terminology here? Yeah, I, I think that that's a really important point because it, it, it highlights kind of cannabis' uh, place as both a cultural touchstone as well as, you know, a plant and then something that we study scientifically. Um, so I, I like to use titles like this because they're provocative. It, it also gets people thinking, oh yeah, like, you know, I, I, a lot of people don't necessarily think of the word cannabis when they're thinking of uh, what they think of as marijuana or butter weed. So I like to tap into that. I think also, um, you know, when zooming back to that idea of the lexicon of, of cannabis, I think it's really important to, you know, know where some of these words came from. Uh, so, for example, I really try to avoid using marijuana as much as possible um, just because of its history of being used in more of this xenophobic, racist term, trying to, you know, get a lot of fear, um, build a lot of fear on the plant. Um, and so I, I think I generally prefer the term cannabis because it has the most scientific relevance. But, you know, when I get people engaged, sometimes the best way to do that is uh, to, to be a little provocative. So that's, that's, that's my feeling. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing. And, um, you know, it's really, really interesting. And I, I'm happy to have you here because this kind of crossroads between um, the kind of standard or, or classic academic or research, um, even, you know, we're talking about NIH-backed uh, research and all this meets this new uh, industry. We're still figuring a lot of things out. So in academia, you know, we're so used to using the exact right word and building these lexicons and standardizing them over time. So, um, yeah, I think that's something that we can bring to the cannabis space over time. But uh, for now, yeah, definitely a provocative title and really interested to hear. So uh, with that, um, I, I think uh, it's a good time to go ahead and start the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing if you want to go ahead and put your uh, presentation up on the screen. Yep, can do. Um, well, yeah, fantastic. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Um, before I get into the content of the talk, I do want to just note that I 
Um, while I have no financial relationships with the cannabis industry, I do sit on a, a data safety and monitoring committee for variable health in an unpaid capacity um, overlooking a clinical trial. Um, so today I want to talk about cannabis as an opioid substitute, um, but I feel like before getting into you know, some of the more scientific uh, aspects of things in terms of cannabinoid mechanisms and uh, you know, some of the, the, the scientific literature, it's really important to, to touch on this context, um, which I'm glad we were able to, to discuss briefly uh, in leading up to this. So cannabis is legal in 33 states right now for medical purposes and 11 for adult use. And this is in spite of cannabis being a schedule one substance, um, which means under the Controlled Substances Act that has no accepted therapeutic value um, and a high potential for abuse. So this has really stifled the type of research that we would ideally like to see um, to best understand the relationship between cannabis and opioids in the pain context. But I also wanna point out um, just briefly how this has actually influenced our society in general and contributed to some of the issues of pain and substance abuse, uh, looking at the criminalization side of things. So for example, just in 2018, there are over 10 million arrests total according to FBI data. Um, to give you a scope of some of how these arrests sh uh, shook out, there are about 520,000 for violent crime uh, and 1.6 million for drug abuse violations, of which 663,000 arrests were for cannabis, mostly possession. And so just to you know, keep in mind that uh, when somebody is arrested, uh, they themselves, uh, their family, maybe people in their community can be traumatized by this. We know that trauma is associated with uh, downstream development of, of chronic pain and actually substance use disorders. So I think it's important to think about uh, these big picture effects of cannabis criminalization, especially because they disproportionately affect communities of color. Now moving more into the medical and pain uh, context, um, one of the reasons that I'm interested in this space, uh, and I think that pain is perhaps one of the most important things to talk about when it relates to cannabis, is because it's far and away the most common reason that people obtain a medical cannabis license. So my colleagues and I uh, pooled data from uh, state registers with uh, medical cannabis, and we looked at all the conditions for which people got these licenses. As you can see, in 2017, uh, chronic pain had more licenses uh, than all the other uh, conditions put together, just showing that you know, this is the space that really people are using cannabis. And I think this has also been you know, moved front and center into the debate about, uh, cannabis has been moved front and center into the debate about chronic pain because of the ongoing opioid crisis which has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives since the late 1990s, uh, including over 47,000 in 2017 alone. And uh, it's important to note that while not all of these deaths, of course, were related to chronic pain, that a lot of people did get started on opioids in the chronic pain context, um, especially when they were not able to access a lot of other evidence-based therapies, especially non-pharmacological therapies for chronic pain. So we know, for example, on the opioid side that um, they're useful for acute pain, but the CDC put out guidelines in 2016 saying they're only appropriate for chronic pain after all else has failed and benefits outweigh risks. And all else includes a lot of those types of therapies that um, both in terms of medications and non-medications that simply are difficult for people to access. I also, because I want to set up this comparison between opioids and cannabis, um, opioids, uh, about 23% of people who use them have some kind of dependence or addiction issue. And then, as I mentioned, they caused uh, over 47,000 4, deaths in 2017. And so this has really contributed to this you know, confluence of factors where people are saying, hey, I'm using cannabis, it helped me get off my uh, pain pills. Is there a way that, you know, this could help with the opioid crisis? And I think, you know, this has shown up both in a lot of anecdotal uh, reports, especially uh, news reports, but it's starting to show up more in the scientific literature, uh, which I'll be diving into today. So with that context, then uh, I wanna share some definitions. 
uh, just a brief nod to this uh, seminal text, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, which was put out by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and, Medi Engineering and Medicine. Suggest everybody download their free copy um, well, if they'd like to look more into this space. And you know, on the definition side, you know, we have cannabis uh, with indica, sativa, and ruderella subspecies. We have cannabinoids, both those of plant origin and um, their analogs that are synthesized in the lab, as well as the ones that uh, are, we make in our own body, the endogenous cannabinoids. Um, and this endocannabinoid system, um, as we know, is getting much more widely studied over the past uh, 20, 30 years, especially is a set of receptors in their naturally occurring ligands um, and enzymes regulating control. Um, and the endocannabinoid system just has a lot of functions that are potentially implicated and valuable in the chronic pain context. So it's been described as um, affecting, it, described as uh, the functions being relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. So involved in memory, analgesia, neurogenesis, immune function, and stress. Um, and so, you know, as we learn more about uh, this system, especially um, the cannabinoid one and two receptors, and, and then as we develop, determine more of the, uh, the receptors and enzymes in this system, I think we'll be able to, to get a much better sense of how to target these therapeutically. Um, however, at this point, you know, a lot of the, the focus, especially with the increasing legalization of cannabis, is on plant-derived cannabinoids, of which there are over 100 known. But uh, as I'm sure you all know, the two most commonly studied are THC and CBD. THC uh, being the compound associated with the cannabis high, um, having analgesic mood altering and appetite stimulating effects, um, as well as being an FDA approved medication in the synthetic form as dronabinol, which is schedule period. And then we also have CBD or cannabidiol, um, which while the, the, the most verified medical effects um, are is an anticonvulsant in Gervais syndrome and other childhood epileptic conditions, um, in preclinical studies has shown great promise um, in terms of being anxiolytic, uh, in anti-inflammatory, um, and uh, just a lot of excitement about, about that possibility as well. And of course, Epidiolex is also Schedule 5, so bring that up as well as, as the Schedule 3 Marinol to just highlight that mismatch between um, herbal cannabis products, including those available in medical and adult use dispensaries, and then um, the types of products that, you know, for research, we would be able to use in clinical settings um, because that, that mismatch is quite quite stark and it's difficult to get the schedule and license to do that type of work. Um, lastly, I just want to point out that um, there is, there, all these other cannabinoids um, are important to look into, but we just have simply not done so. Um, a lot of this, again, due to criminalization. Um, but there, I, I won't mention them beyond saying that there is this current controversy um, in the, the cannabis space in which people um, are trying to decide whether they should use single compounds like THC and CBD as epidiolex and marinol versus whole uh, plant extracts or full spectrum products. Um, because, you know, if you look on more of an herbalist side, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. All of these pieces may act together therapeutically, is what that side says. While the classic pharmacologists say, let's use a single active ingredient that we know is effective, um, why mess with all that other stuff? So um, that's basically the, the landscape for plant-derived cannabinoids at this point. I'm just, again, because I'm setting this up as cannab cannabinoids versus opioids, um, I'm just going to briefly touch on the cannabinoid risks. Uh, obviously, a lot of people smoke cannabis, so there's respiratory effects. About 9% of people do have some kind of a dependence and addiction issue with cannabis. Um, and that goes up uh, among people who start in adolescence. And there's also uh, higher rates of psychotic illnesses among people who start using cannabis under the age of 25. While that there is an association there, I think there's still a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uncertainty about whether uh, that's people are using cannabis and cannabinoids in response to these symptoms or if it's causing them to develop them. But 
um, I think that's a place that there's certainly a lot of research that needs to be done. And then long-term effects on memory and brain structure. Um, in the short term, you know, people can have all of these side effects, uh, most commonly like dizziness, euphoria, anxiety, lightheadedness, less commonly vomiting or uh, seizures. And I, I just want to bring this up also because unlike a classic uh, pharmaceutical like an opioid, um, there is a lot of uncertain quality of herbal preparations. And um, this is getting better as the, the market matures, but um, you know, if people are buying a list of products, they may have things contaminated with, uh, with mold, pesticides or other things like that, uh, that could contribute to, to potential risks, especially in immunocompromised patients. Um, and then lastly, getting behind the wheel of a car um, when using cannabis does, you know, potentially um, increase your risk of a, a vehicle accident as well. So, you know, with that context in mind then, um, let's look a little bit more into what we know about the opioid sparing effects of, of cannabis. So, uh, obviously, both cannabis and opioids have, uh, have risks associated with them, but you know, because cannabis doesn't have that overdose potential um, of opioids, uh, at this point there's very little evidence suggesting that people can die of a, a lethal, or that people have died of a lethal overdose of THC um, or CBD. Uh, I think it's important then to, to, to get a more scientific understanding here of what the landscape looks like. So there have been, Ecological studies, which are more of a statewide studies, uh, looking at how things play out on a national level. And these have shown pretty consistent associations between the passage of medical cannabis laws and decreased opioid prescriptions. Um, some suggestion that there's decreased opioid related hospitalizations uh, as well in states that have legal cannabis uh, for medical purposes versus those that don't. But in terms of opioid overdose deaths, um, this trend has not uh, played out. So there's a highly publicized study that came out in 2014 that um, suggested that there was a decrease in opioid-related overdose um, as re that in states with medical cannabis laws versus those that didn't. Um, but a more recent analysis um, published just last year showed that this trend reversed itself as you added in the later data beyond 2010. So this, you know, could partly be because there's many other factors at play. We simply don't know because um, of the, you know, the, the nature of these studies and we in that we're not tracking individual behavior. Um, on the preclinical side, um, I will talk about clinical trials, but these are very limited. Um, but on the, the preclinical side, there's a pretty consistent trend of, of opioids and uh, cannabis and cannabinoids being providing synergistic pain relief. Um, suggesting that it might be possible to combine the two to then in lower doses, excuse me, to then provide more effective pain relief, which, you know, theoretically could be a, a pretty big win in the sense that if you decrease people's uh, opioid dose, then they have a, a much lower chance of, of overdose or some of the toxicity associated with the use of those drugs. Uh, on the clinical trial side of things, unfortunately, it's very uh, limited. Um, I'd say the, one of the best studies that I've seen so far was, was done by Ziva Cooper and her colleagues um, where they gave folks uh, opioids and inhaled cannabis. And they found that a sub-threshold dose of, of oxycodone plus inhaled cannabis provided better pain relief or similar pain relief to um, the higher dose of opioids alone, which, you know, again, is plausibility that this could be um, useful in this opioid sparing context. It did increase the likability in the sense, or the abuse potential in the sense of likability and wish to take those compounds together again. Um, so it's something to be mindful of. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, this study was conducted in a, kind of an acute use setting and then not in clinical pain populations. So we don't know how this might translate to people who are using, say, opioids for chronic pain. So for that, we have to turn to observational studies um, where we're, you know, they tend to be much less controlled, but we ask people how they're using cannabis in an opioid con or, uh, opioid sparing context, um, or just generally if they're co-using them together. And a couple of trends seem to have emerged in the literature. So the first is substitution, in which um, people, if they add cannabis to 
their treatment regimen and they're using opioids or other pain medications, that they actually taper off of uh, opioids substantially. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the coming slides, but that's the big picture uh, idea. There's also this idea of co-use and misuse where you know, cannabis added into a treatment regimen simply means that the treatment regimen has not changed and they're still, they're also using cannabis. So when we think of the substance abuse um, or addiction side of things, this could be problematic um, for individuals who you know, are trying to get their life back on track and reduce their, their use of these medications. And so some have described these two sets of findings as conflicting. I think they're likely both true and that we just need to better understand who we can use, who, who cannabis is an effective medication in, and then help them use cannabis effectively. And you know, if people don't find it effective, we can uh, help them not use it. Um, on that substitution side, to go a little deeper, um, uh, my colleagues and I published a, a paper that actually, uh, from which I drew the title of this talk, uh, Pills to Pot. And in it, we showed that uh, among over a thousand people who use cannabis for chronic pain, that over 690 of them had deliberately substituted cannabis for opioids. They did so because of better symptom management and fewer negative side effects. Um, this trend held for many other pain medications, including benzodiazepines, um, which I'll highlight just because they're often co-used with opioids in a chronic pain context and co-use of uh, benzodiazepine and opioids is the risk uh, of overdose substantially. Um, also, if you're interested, just put a list of, of overdose and other papers that have found similar trends. Um, this is by no means exhaustive, but just that there are a lot of places, a lot of people and investigators who have replicated these findings, and they've done so not only in the United States, but in Canada and Israel as well. So I think there's a lot of plausibility um, for the importance of doing this kind of work. Um, so, you know, we, we know based on this information that cannabis could potentially uh, be opioid sparing. We know that it's compared to opioids, it's, it's likely significantly less harmful. Um, but how does, it, how does it hold up on the pain side of things? So before I go into that, I want to give a, a little uh, background on, on how the folks at the center I work at and I think about uh, chronic pain. So um, we think of pain coming in three different flavors. There's nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociplastic. The nociceptive is more caused by inflammation and damage. The pain is localized to um, where that damage occurs. So like a bone break or osteoarthritis. Um, while neuropathic is more caused by nerve damage or entrapment, it follows the distribution of peripheral nerves. And you can think of something like carpal tunnel or sciatica um, as a place where that neuropathic pain is showing up. Now in contrast uh, to the first two, nosoplastic is more of a central nervous system um, processing or disturbance problem in which pain is widespread throughout the body. It's accompanied by uh, many different uh, symptoms like fatigue, sleep, and memory problems, um, things like this. The conditions with nosoplastic pain contributions are things like fibromyalgia or tension headache, um, and they're often very, very difficult to treat, um, in, and they include uh, both uh, medications, but also non-pharmacological therapies. And I, I mentioned these three, these three different buckets of pain also um, to note that it's possible for them to occur together. Um, so somebody with fibromyalgia can have a repetitive motion carpal tunnel uh, injury as well as osteoarthritis. Um, so in these three types of pain, uh, at this point it appears that in preclinical models, uh, uh, pain uh, cannabinoid one and two receptor or agonists, excuse me, are, seem to be fairly effective across these different types of pain. Um, CBD is also showing up more in preclinical studies as being effective uh, for neuropathic pain. Uh, however, when we go to the clinical trials for chronic pain, uh, we have some pretty severe limitations in the literature. So this is uh, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis that was published in the journal Pain um, that looked at the, the dozens of clinical trials that had been done. 
And while they show, you know, a generally a small but statistically significant decrease in pain as a result of cannabis therapy, um, they and, you know, at this point, the dozens of other systematic reviews of cannabis and chronic pain note the, the severe methodological flaws um, of the existing literature. So short length, small sample size, the fact that many use THC alone or THC plus CBD, almost none have used CBD alone, um, which makes it really difficult to then draw conclusions from these clinical trials to inform how uh, specifically people should be using uh, cannabis and cannabinoids in the context both of those pain mechanisms, but also in terms of how they're actually using it. I will say that um, there is the most support based on these studies for uh, cannabinoids and neuropathic pain. A lot of those studies have been done with the, uh, the Nabiximals product, uh, which is a one-to-one -one CBD to THC sublingual spray made by GW Pharmaceuticals. So this gives a list of you know, all the, the products that were used in these clinical trials. And I wanna show this to then um, give you a sense of kind of the mismatch between this and what people are actually doing. So in a, a mixed methods analysis that my colleagues and I are doing, um, we, sh we showed that people are using wild, wildly different um, dosing paradigms. So we classified them uh, based on the, the types of administration routes as well as THC versus CBD. Um, so just a couple examples, like, you know, somebody might be using two drops of CBD oil twice a day versus smoking THC down flower out of a pipe multiple times a day. Um, versus using a really complex mixed dosing paradigm where they're combining, you know, CBD twice a day with uh, one to one THC before bed and then vaporizing THC as needed um, for pain relief. And so you can see that, you know, with that in mind, it's also difficult to the generalizability of those clinical trials is really misaligned with how people are using cannabis in these naturalistic contexts. So in terms of how to reconcile those things, I wanna draw from a, a recent con commentary by David Nutt um, that he published in BMJ Open with a few colleagues saying, uh, when thinking about medical cannabis, um, even more important are the N equals one trial as, trials, as these are the core of medical practice since every time a medicine is prescribed an N equals one experiment is being conducted. In some patients, the experiment works and others it fails. The patient either does not respond or the adverse effects outweigh the therapeutic benefit. So I think it's important to you know, draw from this philosophy uh, when thinking about cannabis for chronic pain as well as cannabis uh, as an opioid uh, substitute. Because if we're doing so, we, we, we're taking a really patient-centric approach um, we're working with people where they're at and based on what their preferences are. So if somebody is using CBD or THC or combination in a way that is effective for them and it's, they've come up with a plan with their doctor to show that, then I think it can be a really positive you know, thing to consider. Um, while you know, conversely, if somebody's just adding something into a treatment regimen and nothing changes and their quality of life stays about the same, that seems like more of a cause for concern. So um, in summary, I wanna say that, you know, based on what we know from the preclinical literature um, that as well as the chronic pain uh, clinical trials and observational literature, that there does seem to be plausibility for uh, cannabis uh, being useful for chronic pain analgesia but we have very limited information on the appropriate dose content and administration routes. And we have a real need to better define who would benefit from cannabis, both for analgesia, but also as an opioid substitute. But when we compare the risks and benefits of cannabinoids and opioids in this chronic pain context, it seems pretty clear that cannabinoids should be favored because you know, going back to that National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report, um, that said that there is substantial evidence uh, that cannabis was uh, had potential value for chronic pain management, um, although that was mixed across the type of pain and mostly in the neuropathic pain context. Um, we still see that versus you know opioids, which are generally quite inappropriate in the chronic pain context. 
Um, we see the dependence between the two and risk of addiction is favors uh, cannabinoids. And in terms of, op of deaths, um, you know, we call it the opioid crisis for a reason. Um, it's not the cannabinoid crisis. They're not causing uh, tens of thousands of deaths each year. So um, I'll, I'll finish then with uh, a slide pulled from my mentor, Dr. Daniel Kwa, um, proposing a marketing program for medical cannabis with this cannabis plant talking to a, a poppy plant saying, we don't suck as bad as you do. So with that, um, I would love to take any questions and thanks so much for your kind attention. Thanks, Kevin. I uh, really uh, enjoyed your presentation. So um, lots, of, uh, lots of questions for you. So uh, to kick it off, um, I'm curious uh, to hear you speak more to the, the um, just using uh, full spectrum like you might find when people are using a flower or like a whole plant extract um, in these research studies, maybe your own or maybe uh, other studies that you, you've shown in your presentation. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Uh, what, what actual, you know, cannabinoids or blend of cannabinoids are being used in these studies? Yeah, so um, in, the, in the, say, the clinical trials that uh, have been done thus far, um, you know, many of those do use the, the cannabis sativa flower that is provided by the, the National Institute on Drug Abuse facility, um, or funded facility down at University of Mississippi. Um, so those products do have a characterized cannabinoid profile, but I will say that, um, you know, in terms of how that compares to what people are using in, in a naturalistic setting. I, I think it's pretty clear that the, the naturalistic setting products tend to be much higher, much more potent um, in terms of THC. And I've also seen a lot more reports of say CBG containing products, CBN containing, can, containing products. Um, so, you know, there's, I think there's, there's a lot of issues with generalizability there. Um, in terms of those direct comparisons, a lot of this is happening more in the preclinical space opposed to in clinical trials themselves. Like people typically don't compare, you know, a, a smoked cannabis flower, a uh, full spectrum flower with, you know, smoking pure THC in the context of a clinical trial. But uh, I did see a, a really nice paper that came out of Israel where they compared um, a CBD enriched extract uh, with pure synthetic CBD um, I believe it was for arthritis and inflammation, and they found that in the, the, in the study, I believe it was in mice, but in the mice who were given a synthetic TH CBD, that there's kind of a, this uh, inverse U-shaped curve in dose response. So at a, at a certain point, there was, um, you know, they peaked out on, on the, the dose that provided the, the most anti-inflammatory and pain relieving response. And then after that dose, it kind of leveled off or even decreased. While um, in the, the, the animals that were given the, the full spectrum product, which had a little bit of THC, some terpenes, some of the other cannabinoid compounds, um, that response ended up being linear or more linear. Uh, so suggesting that you know, at least within the scopes of that limited study, that uh, that the full spectrum product could potentially be providing a better uh, better response, both in terms of pain and anti-inflammatory effects. Now, I would love to see that kind of thing replicated in in a, a human study. I think that would be incredibly valuable. Um, but I, I haven't seen too. I haven't seen too many studies that have proposed to do that at this point, just given, you know, the schedule one status of cannabis. So that actually brings up two other questions. I'm kind of torn which one to ask first, but um, <laughs> let me, uh, let me go with this, this one first. What are your thoughts on, uh, you know, in other realms, we have this concept of personalized medicine, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. different. Their dosing is different. And, you know, it's easier in other regards where you have like a single molecule drug where you're combining single molecule drugs that have been well studied in clinical trials. There's data. But in the vein of what you were discussing, where some people respond one way, some people respond another. We're talking about, you know, 
full spectrum, entourage effect, people have different conditions, all this. What are your thoughts on uh, personalized medicine in the cannabis space and maybe more specifically in your realm of treating uh, things that would be traditionally treated with opioids or other pain medication? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, you know, in terms of personalized medicine, I think there are so many definitions of it at this point that, um, you know, are you speaking more to like precision medicine in terms of like targeting somebody's underlying genotype, or do you mean personalized medicine in taking into account patient preferences, what is culturally appropriate to them, um, and then what they have access to based on, you know, the, the space that they're in. Can you, do you mind clarifying that? I, I don't. And, and I actually, I, I appreciate you uh, laying out some of the, the, the facets of it. I, I guess I was speaking to it broadly, but, um, it's interesting that you brought up the uh, genetic part too, because, you know, I, I don't want to use the word rampant, but there's a lot of, you know, tests, genetic tests, can cannabinoid genetic tests out there. And, you know, I it, like so many other things in the cannabis space, I don't know how reliable those are for consumers. So anyways, um, you, you can take the question in, in whatever facet you want, but I think all, <laughs> my answer would be all, any, all of what you said. Okay, cool. Um, so when I think about the, the patient preferences side of things, um, I, I think a lot about harm reduction. So, you know, as I laid out in the talk, that whole um, situation of, you know, cannabis versus opioids, when we think of the, the potential harm and benefit of both, I think the scale is firmly weighted in favor of cannabinoids. Um, I do know that a lot of patients are very, very uncomfortable having conversations with their physicians, um, both because their physicians may have, be coming in with some pre-existing idea that cannabis is just a drug of abuse, um, or because, you know, they're in a legal situation where, you know, a lot of folks with chronic pain are older adults, and so they they came of age in the time of the war on drug escalation and, you know, the Just Say No campaign, campaigns and all of those things. And so it can, it can create a, a, a real communication roadblock, uh, I think, between, between uh, healthcare providers and patients. And so to me, that's one of the, you know, that's one of the biggest things getting in the way of people effectively using cannabis as medication because if, you know, and in this personalized medicine approach way, because if, if a, a patient was able to go into their healthcare provider and say, hey, I'm interested in using this, um, I have chronic pain, but the symptoms that are affecting me the most are sleep and inflammation, say. Then the physician can say, hey, I'm co let's come up with a treatment plan. Let's say, uh, based on what we know about cannabinoid mechanisms and harm reduction, we'll start you off on CBD dominant product um, and maybe add a little THC at nighttime to help you sleep. Let's see how that works for a couple weeks. We'll come back, talk again, um, and then continue uh, met, like basically doing that kind of N, equal, N uh, equals one experiment that David uh, mentions in that commentary. And if it doesn't work, okay, then maybe cannabis wasn't a good medication for you. But if it does, fantastic. Let's start thinking about what else we can do to benefit this patient. Let's bring in some non-pharmacological therapies, which ideally should have been brought in anyways, but you know, uh, bring in some, some more exercise, talk more about functional goals, think about how we can get this person um, back to the point where they're doing the things that are meaningful and purposeful to them um, and, you know, there's tons of reports showing that cannabis it has been that medicine for some people, and then also tons of reports showing that it's not that medicine for some people. So let's, you know, let's figure out who, who it is, who, who will best respond, and, and let's make sure that physicians feel comfortable having those conversations. I, I think, you know, it speaks to, to more of a legal context, like if, if cannabis was descheduled, a lot of this type of stuff would ideally change more quickly because physicians wouldn't have to be concerned about, you know, potentially losing their licenses or, um, 
you know, giving advice about using a Schedule One substance to a patient. Like, I think there's a lot of fear out there that is impacting the ability to bring this personalized medicine context to the, the cannabis context as well. I, I think you're absolutely right. Stigma remains a big issue. And um, yeah, you know, that, that's hard to deal with, but I, I think it's evolving over time. The other kind of comment that I would make off yours is that I do know a few doctors in, you know, states that have a history of being legal that are, that do this type of N equals one, you know, cannabis focused or cannabis incorporating treatment with patients. But I think it would be great to go beyond that to the point where we have doctors or institutions who are, you know, working with and understanding the products that are actually coming off the shelves and the dispensaries or the people are actually using um, actively and commonly on an N equals thousands, tens of thousands to, to have this broader perspective of what works and doesn't from the populace to then take to this individual, just like we do with other medications. Right. So, uh, but, but your, your comments were, were all, you know, very reasonable. So this brings up a, another question and I'm curious, uh, as you've, you know, been interacting with folks in the research space, I know it's common, it's nice in research that jurisdictions, we, we can work with people in other jurisdictions, right? And in an area like this, um, you mentioned Israel, you mentioned Canada. I'm just curious, um, ha have you, uh, do you, have you had any experiences that you'd like to share with the audience from working with folks in other jurisdictions, maybe the uh, differentials between their ability to perform research with patients or with you know common products versus here? Yeah, so, you know, as someone fairly new in this space, I haven't, um, I don't have any, like, very robust ongoing collaborations with, with folks in other countries at this point in time, but I will say I've had, you know, some really nice conversations, especially with folks in Canada, uh, like Philippe Lucas, and, you know, some of these companies, like, he's, he's at Tilray, and they're sponsoring numerous clinical trials um, where they're able to use their own products with varying CBD and THC ratios. Everything is GMP. And, you know, in some ways it follows the classic pharmaceutical model because if when they have the results of those clinical trials, they'll be able to say, hey, we're still selling this product. Um, so I think, you know, in places like Canada, Canada, which have that, you know, federal legalized um, paradigm in place that there's many fewer restrictions on the type of stuff that can be done um, both going back to that uh, idea of the full spectrum versus um, you know individual ingredient products as well as on the personalized medicine uh, front too so and I, I just want to quickly add on I, I totally agree with you that um, you know, the, the sort of population level experiments that could be done through registries and that kind of, um, you know, that kind of data collection that you alluded to, I think is, is absolutely one of the most important things to do moving forward because clinical trials take years to, to complete and people are, you know, at this point, uh, estimates range to several, several millions of people in the US alone are using this stuff now. So let's understand their experiences and use that to inform the best clinical studies and also frankly, make sure that they're using products that are of known quality that don't have contaminants and contain what they're supposed to. Well, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a, um, a common thread with, with folks in the space <laughs> who, um, who, are, who are, let's say it uh, in the know. So we had um, a, another question uh, you had this slide about the three different types of pain. Could we scroll to that? Yeah. So I thought it was interesting um, that only one of these is actually um, listing opioids as a treatment. So our question is, is there, or are there, can it, excuse me, is cannabis a treatment for just the one that lists opioids as an opioid replacement, or is it applicable to these other types of pain? Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, uh, I, I love that question, and, and thank you, because then I can geek out a little bit. Um, <laughs> so 
I think that's one of the big questions in the pain space. So those clinical trials which were done, like I said, most of them are done in neuropathic pain. But, you know, for example, following surgery with no susceptive pain, um, is it possible that somebody could be given CBD as an opioid sparing compound, uh, for example, or a combination of TH2 and CBD as an opioid sparing compound as they're, you know, getting movement back? Um, that would be great. Uh, in terms of, um, you know, neuropathic and nosoplastic pain, um, both of these do tend to be, uh, well, they have been historically treated quite frequently with opioids. Um, just those are not the treatments that are optimal in any way for them. Um, so that's why opioids are not listed uh, for those two types of pain. Um, but I think, you know, as, as this field matures, one of the things that's gonna be really valuable is understanding how to synchronize what we know about cannabinoid mechanisms with, synch with what we know about pain mechanisms. And that's how, you know, from the you know, academic side, we, we really tap into that idea of precision or personalized analgesia. Um, because for example, we know that CBD in preclinical studies tends to be more anti-inflammatory, tends to, and, and also tends to be pretty well tolerated in clinical populations from clinical trials. Does that mean that a CBD alone or full spectrum CBD product with just a little THC would be perfect for something like rheumatoid arthritis? It's possible. We just simply don't know. Um, but I think that there's a lot of, you know, possibility there to, to continue looking into how to best fit these pieces together. Um, does that answer your question or should I go a little more? No, no, that's that's very helpful, and and actually, um, it it plugs in with a, another thought that I was having. Um, can uh, in in this we can geek out on this a little bit too. Uh, can you uh, elaborate on? You mentioned this thing about uh, cannabis not having the opioid risk or not having the overdose risk of the opioids. Can you speak to that a little bit? Um, I think it's a good thing to clarify to our listeners that yeah. are. Um, why is that? Because a lot of people say, so you can't overdose on cannabis, but can you explain why there's a differential there? So I, I think some of it relates to, you know, how well, um, how well THC and CBD are binding to the cannabinoid receptor. So like uh, THC, to my knowledge, is a partial agonist of, of cannabinoid receptor one. That's very common in the central nervous system, including uh, in the brain, but, um, you know, that partial binding means that it, it doesn't have that kind of really intense, you know, overdose potential in the same way as, say, a synthetic can, uh, cannabinoid. So, um, for example, there have been op or cannabinoid overdose deaths from some of these more potent lab chemicals that do directly bind to CB1. Um, so I think that has something to do with it. Um, I think it's also about the location of the CD1 receptors not being located in the, the parts of the brain associated uh, with more like the, the breathing and uh, you know the, the types of functions that sh shut down uh, with relation to opioid overdose. Um, so I think there's that involved as well. Um, and then you know I think that going back to that partial ligand. Uh, comment there's you know to a certain extent it, that means that you just have to take way way more of THC to get closer to that more toxic threshold it's not to say that people can't take large quantities of THC and be incredibly uncomfortable um, can be their lives can be disrupted for days on end or they could potentially have a psychotic episode um, it's not to say it's without risk it just you know, means that it doesn't have that kind of lethal toxicity as an opioid overdose. Um, so there's that. I will say, you know, also just going to give a little bit more of, um, of nuance to the, you know, some of the deaths that do happen due to cannabis overdose. You know, some people with underlying heart conditions, there can, like, you know, even if they're not taking a lethal dose of THC, that can activate that un underlying heart condition and cause a heart attack, which could then be a, you know, a cannabis caused death or those behavioral deaths, like getting behind the wheel of a car, um, especially in com if somebody's 
uh, also having alcohol or other intoxicating substances can certainly contribute to, to death that way too. Yeah, thank you for kind of clarifying the, the mechanistic level um, of it and then also kind of talking about some of the, the real world kind of, kind of applications. So we have a, a, another question from the audience um, asking if you could uh, share thoughts or comments on your most recent uh, publication is uh, clinical outcomes and lower daily doses. Uh, do you have any thoughts that you want to share on that? Mm -mm. The, so, yeah. So with that one, um, that was in the same uh, population as the, the pills to pot uh, paper. And in that one, we looked at folks who were using cannabis seven days a week and we looked at how they were, how many times per day they said they were using cannabis. So, um, once to twice a day, three to four times a day, or five or more, excuse me, times per day. And within that paper, we saw that, you know, people who are using cannabis once or twice a day had a, a fairly substantially different use profile than those who are using multiple times a day, as well as a different clinical profile. So in terms of use profile, those who use less often were more likely to use topicals, tinctures, edibles, um, while those who used it uh, more frequently, we're more likely to, you know, vaporize or uh, or smoke. So that suggests those those different use patterns come with different levels of risk because obviously smoking has um, both the respiratory effects as well as uh, that quick onset, um, quick spike of THC in the bloodstream, quick decline and, and up and down and up and down which could potentially lead to more abuse addiction potential. And on the clinical phenotype side of things, um, I believe those folks who use more frequently also had uh, worse pain interference and uh, clinical pain severity than those who use less frequently. So, you know, taken together, this, this could mean a couple different things. It could mean, you know, people who are using more frequently, um, you know, they're using it less effectively. So if they, you know, moved away from the high THC products, if they uh, used, say, uh, in more of a paradigm that more mimics what uh, would be used in like an extended release, fast release setting for breakthrough versus baseline pain control, that perhaps that could be more helpful. It also, you know, potentially speaks to the fact that folks who have more clinical pain, um, and have more pain interference need to use cannabis more frequently to control their symptoms. So it could be both or any combination of those things. Um, because it's a cross-sectional study, we can't really tease out those details. Um, but I thought that it was a really interesting thing to find out that um, one, that these different use patterns do seem to exist as well as um, you know, what they mean about, how, about people's pain. But yeah, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing more detail on that. So we're um, getting close to the end of the hour. I, I wanted to ask you uh, this question that I, I kind of like to pose to uh, folks at the end of the Journal Club session. And, and that is, if there was um, one kind of change, improvement that you could make, be it changing a law, be it changing a something in the research community, well, whatever you want to speak to, what, what would you change to kind of improve or accelerate uh, research in your field? Mm, yeah. Um, <laughs> so if, if we're talking specific to cannabis, I think that uh, that rescheduling cannabis from Schedule 1 is, is a pretty obvious um, change that needs to be made if we want to both, you know, understand how to best use this plant medically, um, as well as how to, uh, you know, reduce the damage that it can do both on the medical addiction abuse side, but uh, more on the societal side of things. Um, I think that, you know, keeping cannabis schedule one, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, causes an immense burden of societal pain. Um, and if, if we can try to remediate that as best as possible, uh, one lot to do that would, would certainly be to, to reschedule cannabis. I appreciate how we're not only now talking about an individual's uh, pain 
within their body, we're talking about this societal pain, <laughs> right? <laughs> so a um, lot, lot of a lot of pain going on that, that we could that we could maybe do something better about. So no, I I, uh, I think that's that's excellent input. So, anyways, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for your uh, excellent presentation and for sharing your thoughts with us. And um, we look forward to, you know, discussing with you more in, in the CAN community soon. That's great. Thanks so much for having me. It was a, a delight being here, and, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to present. So, fantastic. Absolutely. Well, uh, take care, and thank you to all our audience members. We'll see you again next month.